Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Laura. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sophie. Um, I am a technical officer here at Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And um, my background is in solar physics. I did my PhD in, in solar physics and studying kind of flaring um, um, active regions. Um, but for many years, I worked in a space weather forecasting center. So I kind of work in the, the middle between the two um, and these days and in a sort of like transitioning research into operations. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about space weather forecasting with you this morning. And just so we're on the same page, in case um, some of you aren't aware of, of space weather, um, what I'm talking about is changing environmental conditions in near Earth space. And it's very you know, basic. Um, definition and um, very much changing conditions that are causing um, changes to our infrastructure and our technology which have societal impact. I mean that's really the key thing um, with space weather is the technological side of things um, and, and very much in this talk I'm going to be focusing on the solar kind of side of things so space weather that are caused by solar eruptive phenomena I know there are all, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but there are also cosmic rays, which is something I know nothing about. So we're not gonna talk about that, <coughs> um, but we're gonna talk about the solar side of things. And this is um, a classic ESA, um, I guess, kind of infographic of all the kinds of impacts of space weather. I know Peter showed it on Monday as well. It's one that all of us love using over and over again. Um, but it does summarize the kinds of impacts you could have uh, really, really nicely, you know, from nearer space all the way down to the ground. You can see astronauts here, and this is something that's ever more important in our kind of new space exploration era because strong radiation dosages from the sun will, you know, could impact the health of astronauts. So they have to make sure they are nicely protected from solar storms and um, if they're on the way in the International Space Station. Um, it will impact spacecraft as well. You know, these, these radiation storms can cause damage to spacecraft. They could disrupt instrumentation. So, you know, space agencies and, and, and other spacecraft companies have to really make sure that they design and, and they build their spacecraft quite robustly with good shielding to make sure that they can withstand these kinds of events. Um, and, you know, I think we use satellites for so many different things from, from monitoring and also for navigational purposes. You know, we use our, our GPS on our phones. They connect to several different spacecraft to pinpoint our location on, on Google Maps and things like that. But space weather can disrupt that navigational capability because we could lose communication with our spacecraft. And so it'll in, you know, interrupt navigation. And also communications in general, you can see this kind of zigzag pattern here, which is donating high frequency radio communication, those, those radio waves bouncing off the ionosphere. Um, and that can be disrupted during space weather events. And I know Laura will talk about that a little bit more um, after my talk. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's very much a, a very relevant topic for, for a radio workshop is the kind of radio communication and blackouts that you can get from space weather events. And of course there are, um, you know, impacts further down on the ground as well. You can see these geomagnetically induced currents. So these can cause you know, power surges and, and damage to long conductors like oil and gas pipelines. And these power surges can of course disrupt electrical grids as well. So there's a whole array of impacts in, in space weather, you know, from, from, from high up down to the ground. And you can see it really does impact technology. And that's why space weather is becoming more and more of an important topic, I think, because we are, as a society, becoming more and more technologically dependent. You know, of course, in this pandemic era, especially, I think the Zoom workshop is the perfect example of this. You know, we're still being able to communicate with each other and run a space weather workshop on Zoom rather than in person. Um, so it's, it's something that's, you know, becoming more important in our society. And I think it's a useful thing for researchers who are in solar or heliospheric or, or you know, earth impact science to know about, um, because it's likely you're gonna to have to talk about space weather at some point, whether it's for you know, a public talk and talk about the aurora, which I didn't even mention, it's a classic you know, natural phenomena associated with space weather, or, or even for writing that impact section of your, your proposals. You know? um, space weather is probably gonna come up. And I think understanding the kinds of impacts that space weather can have can be really, really useful for your research. Um, and so usually when I talk about kind of you know, space weather and trying to, to show people the, the importance of, of forecasting it, I tend to show some real world examples you know, there's some classics with uh, there's some 1989 storms, which caused power blackouts in Canada. There were the Halloween storms in 2003, which caused kind of havoc to aviation. So aviation use you know, radio communications, but they also have that radiation impact as well. Um, and to satellites as well. 
but actually a really nice recent example, which I think is super relevant um, to this, the space weather workshop are the September 2017 events. So of course you all kind of looking at some of that data and it's been referred to a few times and you know messing around with that sort of data in the hands-on session, particularly in the solar sources session on Monday, you would have had a look at this sunspot group. And, and this is the one that caused all the havoc back in 2017 in September. Um, and it, you know, active region, I think one, two, six, seven, three. As a solar physicist, you end up remembering too many active region numbers as you look at the sun too much. Um, so this active region, which was super active, and it produced, um, as you would have messed around with ghost plots on Monday, lots and lots of flares. And I know Shane would have mentioned the different classifications of, 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 of sort of flares. You've got these A, B, C, M, and X flares. So the A, Bs, and Cs are, you know, are useful, kind of great to study from a science perspective. They don't necessarily cause huge amounts of big space weather events. It's usually the Ms and the Xs that we really care about from a, from a space weather perspective. And you can just see how active this region was over this period in the first week of September. There was just absolutely loads of M class flares, a couple of big X9s as well. And the, the September 6 X9 flare was the largest in the solar cycle, I think solar cycle 24 at the time, and the brightest recorded since um, flare back in 2005, um, which was in kind of the declining phase of solar cycle 23. So massive events. It was actually associated with, I think that the September 10th event was associated with a solar energetic particle event that hadn't, we hadn't seen one like that since 2012. So had quite a lot of, of, of uh, flux so to cause ground level enhancements there. Um, and, but when I think of solar flares, I think of in terms of space weather impacts, the radio blackouts and the GPS disruptions. Um, and this event definitely caused consistent radio blackouts across the globe um, during this week in September. This is just a classic kind of um, visualization of degraded frequency for high frequency radio communications that you'll see you know, in lots of different uh, space weather forecasting centers. This one is particularly from a paper by Redmond et al. Because what they were showing is just really how strong the September event was. This was from the 6th of September with that X9 flare. And you can see the space, so basically, usually these plots don't have such uh, large amounts of red in them. They're kind of, you know, in the black, kind of purple, blue area. But this was huge amounts of degraded frequency. So massive radio blackouts all the way across the Atlantic. You know, it was extending from when you were up all the way across to America, the Gulf of Mexico, South America there. So, you know, it was impacting a huge part of, of um, this Atlantic sort of civil aviation, um, you know, communication area. And this is actually a plane here that the paper was highlighting um, was a French plane. It was the French Civil Aviation Authorities reported some high frequency radio um, contact lost um, with an aircraft off the coast of Brazil there for, for a couple of hours and they, they couldn't get in contact with them um, until they managed to ping through New York. So definitely impacted aviation, but that's kind of a standard thing, you know, that we would expect from a large space weather event. The thing that makes the September events really interesting is the other stuff that was happening on Earth at the same time. So when I think of space weather forecasting, I consider it a natural hazard. It's a phenomenon that's causing changes on Earth. And of course, the other kind of natural hazards you can have are Earth related, um, you know, so terrestrial weather rather than space weather. And at the time of the September X flares, we had this happening across the Atlantic. And um, so this is a, 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 an image from the the Xiaomi um, NPP weather satellite on September the 6th, so the same time as this X9 flare is going off, and you can see these hurricanes, Katia, Irma, and Jose just lining up across the Atlantic, hitting the Caribbean um, and Florida there and, and the Gulf of Mexico. So there was a lot going on in terms of severe space weather and weather events at the very same time, which is a very rare thing to happen. So you know, you know, on the sun 150 million kilometers away, we had all this X flare stuff going off, um, which is going to cause impacts to our radio communications. And of course, what do we use? radio communications for often emergency planning. So we had, um, you know, radio operators assisting with radio communications for emergency purposes, you know, evacuating people from their homes when the hurricanes were hitting in the Caribbean. Um, at the same time, the impact to the X flares were hitting Earth, so they couldn't use their radios, um, which was a really, really bad um, thing to happen at the same time with these hurricanes. Um, you know, we had 
reports, and particularly for the 6th of September, of radio communications going down for most of the morning, early afternoon. I think um, the, one of the, the forecasting centres confirmed that basically high frequency radio, which is going to be used by these emergency bands, aviation, maritime, ham radio, and lots of different things was unavailable for up to about eight hours on the 6th. And that was just the 6th. Of course, there were other events happening throughout the rest of that week. So it was really not a good combination of natural hazards happening. And it was a bit of a perfect storm. Um, I'm just going to put up a quote here from, there's a series of papers in the Space Weather Journal about the September events. If you're interested, I can put the link in Slack later on, but it's a fascinating kind of discussion of all kinds of things that can happen. Um, from space weather events. This is from Gonzalez Esparza et al. Um, because they mentioned, and um, they're looking at the Gulf of Mexico, you had these X fires, you had the hurricanes, but also there were two major earthquakes happening at Mex in Mexico at the exact same time. And they say the conjunction of these natural phenomena, <clears throat> excuse me, were close to creating a worst case scenario in terms of civil protection reaction. So not good. Um, and I think it really highlights how important it is to monitor space weather, monitor weather events at the same time. And this is becoming an ever, ever more important issue in our society. And it really is that sort of interlink um, between different things happening that could impact our infrastructure. And um, this is a really interesting kind of confusogram um, that kind of shows you the bigger picture in terms of connections and interdependencies across the US economy and um, from the Department of Homeland Security. And you can see that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's dependencies across loads of different areas of, of technologies and infrastructures that we use every day um, in our lives. You know, if the space weather event causes the power to go down, that's going to have an impact on lots of different things from our transportation to our emergency services to our communications, which of course can be impacted by space weather as well, um, and government services. And even space weather can impact some of these other things individually. You know, we use high precision GPS timing for our stock markets. We use GPS to open and close train doors in the UK automatically. So there's, there's impacts singly in all these different areas but also all these interdependencies. So if one thing goes down, it can have a knock-on effect. So governments really have to make sure that they plan um, for these kinds of scenarios and, and, and be able to mitigate these events if they happen. And I mentioned this is you know, connections in the economy um, because finance has a lot to do with it as well. It's not just a, an infrastructural technological impact. It has an economic um, impact as well. This is a really interesting paper by um, Alton et al. They're, they're UK economists and they worked with some, um, um, some, some researchers in the US who work on geomagnetic storms. And what they did is they, they figured out a worst case scenario of what would happen if a space weather event caused you know, all these states, the power grids in all these states to go down at the same time. And the US has a very interconnected power grid. So if kind of one goes down and lots of others might do as well. And you can see there's so lots of different state, states are affected. And you can see the daily customer disruptions for this power going down in these different states in the millions. So we would have an absolutely massive impact. Of course, you know, we're used to, to power going down during severe weather events and storms and stuff like that. And this is on a much, much bigger scale than those kinds of localized weather events. And um, you can see a lot, particularly on the East Coast, we've got, you know, big cities, governments, but also manufacturing like here. So, you know, if your, your factory um, goes down, you can't send goods to, to some customers. Um, both, you know, in other states and around the world, if the ports are closed, you can't import things. And um, so it has a, a direct loss. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah. yeah um, that paper, is that, um, that was only power grids, right? Yeah, That's only power grids. Financial cost if there is an extreme event and power grids go down. Exactly. So it's okay. just one aspect. So it's only a geomagnetic storm. Okay. nothing to do with a flare or an uh, solar energetic particle okay. event. Okay. So um, it's, a, it's a nice isolated case. I don't know if they've, anybody's done a big massive um, kind of US ec economic study for all three. I think they probably focus on very specific geomagnetic stuff so far. Thanks.
Um, so yeah, you can see, you know, and that's a really interesting thing that Peter mentioned, it is just, just geomagnetic storms, it's not the other kinds of space weather events. Um, you can see this daily direct loss in billions of US dollars. And as I said, it's not just to the US economy, it's to the people that they import and export to. So, you know, lots of different European countries there, Ireland's on the list. So, you know, the thing I guess I'm really trying to highlight with this is that it's a global phenomenon. You know, um, it really, you know, if it's not an, a, an isolated thing like a, a hurricane or a tornado or whatever, um, it can cause impacts across the entire world if something like that happens. So governments have to be prepared. And I mentioned it's, um, you know, these kind of studies are focused on something called a worst case scenario. And this is something that we've learned from weather forecasting. We learn a lot from our terrestrial weather forecasters who have been, um, you know, doing this for decades and um, before we came along with our space weather stuff. Um, and they have a really classic concept of something called a one in 100 year event, which is kind of a worst case scenario. It's like a 1% chance of it happening every year. So it's a rare event, but it's the, you know, the worst case and something that you really do have to make sure you mitigate. Um, and in space weather, our one in 100 year event is actually taken um, from the example of a real world event, the biggest space weather event that we've yeah, ever um, you know, monitored before on the planet. Um, and that was the Carrington event of 1859. So a really powerful geomagnetic storm, the largest geomagnetic storm on record, came from the sunspot region here, which was drawn um, by um, a couple of British astronomers, one called Carrington, hence the name Carrington, um, which gave off a massive white light flare as well, which is super rare. So it was a massive storm. It had you know, all the kinds of associated um, events with it and uh, caused auroral displays all across the world. So this is what you're seeing here from, from Clyde Isle. And these are, I think they're from newspaper records of just people have seen the aurora um, when the storm hit. And you can see it goes all the way down towards, you know, Cuba and beyond towards the, you know, basically equator word, um, which is absolutely fascinating because we really don't see that happening with our big storms, you know, like the 1989 or the 2003 storms. You might have seen some aurora in, in Ireland, but you really wouldn't go um, very, very, very far down. Like this is a massive, massive storm. Um, and of course, we didn't have the technology back then like we do today, but they did have telegraph systems. So that does give us a bit of an idea um, of what might happen to our systems today. And it did cause quite severe damage to telegraph systems. This is an interesting newspaper clipping from um, a Boston um, newspaper in the US. They basically, they said the auroral display was so bright that they could read the newspapers by its light outside after midnight. They didn't need street lights or anything like that. Um, and it considerably impeded the working of the telegraph lines. So the auroral current from east to west was so regular that the operators on the eastern lines could send messages to the city without the usual batteries being applied. So massive power surges there. You can really imagine what it might do to our electrical grid if we weren't prepared nowadays you'd have widespread blackouts electrical disruptions you know radio and communication disruptions so it is our worst case scenario and we haven't seen an event like that hit earth ever since the carrington event um, i believe there was one that was sort of we think a similar magnitude that was observed by stereo back in 2012 but it was around the back of the sun so it kind of pers passed earth's orbit without striking us i think we missed it by about a week or so i can't remember for sure um, but we we haven't seen one hit earth again um, but this is the, the the kind of event that emergency planners and governments will um, plan to mitigate um, and it's something that's becoming ever more important it's really being picked up by governments all around the world that they have to be prepared for these space weather events considering the kinds of impacts it can have on our technologies and um, so much so that you'll generally see space weather added to national risk registers and um, so you know these are the kinds of risks that they list and um, that are, are you know can be natural hazards as in the case of space weather or other things like you know internet related or, or pandemic related um and so if somebody who has that risk has to mitigate that risk when there has to be an owner of that risk this is an example of um, the natural hazard risk assessment from the uk back in 2019 just to give you a sense of where space weather sits on these kinds of risk registers and it's actually quite high um so you have kind of um you know classic things that might you know impact the uk things like flooding and um, storms and um, you know 
drought, things like that, volcanic eruptions, that's actually volcanic ash that got added to risk registers. I don't know if you remember, many years ago, there was an Icelandic volcanic eruption which caused havoc with aviation. So that was why that's there. Um, but you can see space weather's here. So it's, you know, it, it has kind of, it's like kind of like medium in the likelihood and, and kind of medium to high in the impact severity. But because it's on the risk register, um, somebody has to mitigate that risk. So a government will deem um, one of its departments an owner of that risk. Um, and that means that there's now loads of different forecasting centers um, all around the world who are working to provide guidance and forecasts um, to users like the, um, the, the spacecraft operators, the, the aviation community, and um, the power grid operators, people that might be impacted by space weather events, even the general public, of course, you know, the Aurora hunters of the world. Um, and, and just to show you how, how kind of popular it's gotten, um, I don't know if popular is the right word, but sorry, you know, sorry, so yeah, go you, ahead, you're fine. <laughs> where is um, global pandemics on that risk register? Um, it's not on this one because the UK split it. I used to show an old graph. I don't know if you remember it. It was all of the risk register and pandemic is up here. It would be in the four or five box. Okay. Um, so it's a shame it's not on it anymore because it would be a nice joke. I think I always used to say, oh, well, it's the pandemic is up the top. It's really rare. So we have no concept of you know, so wait, back in the day of what it would be like. But that kind of tells you the kinds of, um, you know, likelihood and, and severity. So why was it's it quite up? high. Um, it's not cut off. It's just separated. It's the, the, the most recent risk assessment separated natural hazards from other hazards. Ah, so there's okay. there's things like data and cybersecurity and stuff okay. in the other one. Okay. Um, so it is on there. Usually, um, I think it was it was actually kind of all just just above the, the winter storms. So okay. it used to be just above there. So, yeah, we all know what kinds of impacts the pandemic can have okay. nowadays. <laughs> um, but, yeah, a lot of governments will split these hazards now to just make it um, a little bit easier to digest because the owners tend to be, uh, you know, and you can see from this map, they tend to be weather forecasting centers, actually. Um, you know, somebody who already, you know, forecasts these kinds of hazards like hurricanes or, or, or winter storms or whatever have the expertise to forecast space weather as well. And um, the first ever space weather forecasting center set up many decades ago now was the US, the, the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, um, which is part of NOAA. They're, so that's their National Weather Forecasting Service. Um, and they are one of the three 24-7, 365 forecasting centers around the world. So you have SWPSI, um, the US Air Force, and the UK Met Office, um, which is uh, also in a weather forecasting center. So it's generally a meteorologist who is sitting on the space weather bench as part of the natural hazard bench. So they're trained in forecasting these volcanic eruptions, these floods, these winter storms, and space weather as well. Um, so they tend to be dual trained and there will be someone always there monitoring, you know, these solar conditions on all their different monitors and keeping an eye on what's happening. There are other forecasting centers embedded within uh, weather centers like in, in Australia here. Um, but there's also space agencies as well, you know, ESA, SAMSA here in South Africa and researchers also um, will provide space weather guidance, um, such as SITC in Belgium, the Koreans. Um, so there's a there's a variety of different kind of forecasting from the hardcore 24 seven to the nine to five scientists producing forecasts for different countries. Um, but the key is that all of these forecasting centers are highlighted are part of the International Space Environment Services. And um, so this is, you can learn more about it at spaceweather.org, but it's basically a collaborative network um, of all space weather service providing organizations around the world. And the key with that is, you know, why they set it up is that, as I was saying, it's a global phenomenon. So they need to make sure that they are providing consistent messages around the world. This isn't a localized forecast for one country. You want the Americans and the British and the Australians to agree with each other in terms of the severity of an event. So they talk to each other regularly. They have you know, phone calls and internet forums and things like that um, to make sure that they coordinate these services. Um, and they all have diff slightly different types of forecasts, but they actually are kind of quite generally similar because a lot of the different users in their countries will be pretty similar. Um, they are not science experts. Um, so a space weather forecast does not look like a kind of a science product that we would look at. You know, there's really complex plots. It can be something as simple as this, 
is from um, the Space Weather Prediction Center in the US. If you go on their main page, this is what you'll see. Um, it's a traffic light color scheme. So, you know, green, normal conditions, um, yellow, red, severe conditions. Um, and it, it's very simple to ensure that all different kinds of users will be able to understand it. And then they'll also provide tailored guidance to particular users that might be more complex um, such as model outputs and things like that as well and um, so i'd like to talk you through um, what a forecast looks like and how we go about making these kinds of forecasts um, and and really you know what are these r s and g's and the key thing with with these kinds of space weather impacts is that it's actually linked to their solar source you know you can almost call it solar eruption prediction and um, the r is associated with radio blackouts. So that's R for radio blackouts, but it's really the solar flare. You know, it's those emissions of, of EM radiation across the whole entire electromagnetic spectrum. You know, so the huge emissions of energy going out in all directions, impacting things like our navigation and our communications. And so when they're monitoring um, for radio blackouts, what they're really doing is monitoring flare activity on the sun. G is for geomagnetic, and I said geomagnetic induced currents before, so this is our power grids. Um, and this is related to our plasma, you know, eruptions on the sun. So you've got your, your solar wind streams, which is kind of like the background, everyday space weather conditions, which will cause things like the aurora in our, in our higher latitude regions. Um, but for those aurora to come further south, um, you have to have a more extreme space weather event. So high speed solar wind streams from coronal holes, but also your coronal mass ejections as well. So, you know, it's these er eruptions of plasma, but just much faster and more dense than your normal solar wind. Um, and it will be, you know, it's embedded in a magnetic field. So you're talking about magnetic field changes, you know, in physics, changing magnetic fields means changing electric fields. So you get these induced currents and transformers um, which can impact your, your power grids. And I know we'll have um, some talks about the magnetosphere a little bit later on. So you'll learn more about these kinds of impacts um, to Earth's magnetic field. So G for geomagnetic, again, linked to our solar source uh, phenomenon. And then S for solar radiation storms. So these things that can impact astronauts or spacecraft instrumentation. Um, and uh, something that's, I guess, ever more important now, particularly um, these radiation storms, is because we have this new era of space exploration, you know, Richard Branson versus Jeff Bezos recently and um, SpaceX and their plans for Mars missions and things like that. So, you know, if we're going to go on a really big, long Mars mission, we want to make sure the astronauts in those spacecraft are well protected from sort of radiation storms and lethal dosages. And um, so it's a very, very hot topic for sure in space weather forecasting. And these are coming from um, accelerated electrons and protons. So our solar energetic particle events, um, you know, these are electric, you know, accelerated you know, associated with flares and or CME events. And you can see the kinds of impacts there it can have. So this coronagraph image, all this kind of white noise or these particles hitting um, the camera. So you want to make sure your spacecraft are, are super well shielded and able to handle this kind of thing. Um, so, so these are our, our three main parts of the space weather forecast. Um, and you can see it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a combination of monitoring and forecasting. You know, they are going to keep an eye on the sun and what's happening, see what's happened, you know, latest observed over the past 24 hours, but they're also going to try and predict what's going to happen in the next 24 hours as well. And interestingly, you can see here, there are some categories, you know, R1 to R5, kind of like a hurricane category in weather, you know, so the levels of severity and, and S1 here as well. And there are probabilistic forecasts. So there are percentage chance of an event occurring in a particular time period. And um, so how do we get to that forecast part? And this is where the research comes in. You know, this forecasting part is where you as, as, as researchers in this area can um, provide um, some real new insights and improve upon the state of the art and forecast by better understanding, you know, solar heliospheric phenomena and on our Earth impacts too. Um, I'm going to use um, the classic example of a solar flare forecast to just talk you through how this forecasting process works. It's my area of expertise, but it's also one of the oldest types of forecasting in, in space weather. I think it's We've been forecasting flares for decades. And um, so there's a, a lot of examples out there and kind of how the process works. 
And, and for any forecast, whether it's a flare or an SEP or, or a weather forecast phenomenon, um, in order to create a forecast, you need to identify something that is associated with that type of event. Um, and this is why a flare forecast is a really nice example because it's kind of an obvious one. Um, we know, you know, we've been talking about it already past few days, it's these sunspot regions or these active regions and magnetograms and um, that are associated with flaring activity. Um, so this is our property and this is, you know, going back to the 2017 event again, you can see as a solar expert, I would look at this and I would, you know, you might think as a non-expert, oh, that looks like a kind of a big region, but you can see as it, as it evolves across the disk, it doesn't really do much. It stays pretty stable. So this was not um, in a region that produced a lot of flares because it was kind of a stable decaying region. But this region here that caused all the havoc, it um, absolutely evolved insanely rapidly over just a couple of days. And you can see it gets really large and really magnetically complex very, very quickly. So that's a classic candidate just by eye and um, for something that's going to give off flares big, what we call magnetically complex region. And it's that concept of magnetic complexity that's our property that we can use as a starting point to our forecast. You know, we can <clears throat> have a look at our data measure the area, you know, see how big the region is. Bigger regions tend to be more complex. And we can measure maybe properties like the total magnetic flux and the total magnetic helicity in the region, the twistedness of the magnetic fields and the total current density. So we can take actual values from our data and use that as a starting point to our forecast. Or for operations, they tend to be actually similar and kind of eye things like I was just doing there and use a classification scheme. And um, so Shane's already showed you this on Monday. You know, this is a perfect example of the kind of thing you'll get in operations um, is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you know, the hell classification. So these simple alpha spots um, are much, much, much less likely to flare than these, um, you know, much more kind of intermixed polarities, bigger delta spots. Um, and it's a really simple classification, um, but it's really, really popular in operations. Simple, robust, well-tried methods are key for operational procedures. And so we have a characterization, um, you know, we have a property. And then we need to convert it into that flare forecast, um, which will generally look at something like this. This is from the UK Met Office, and you can see it's a little bit more in depth um, because it's a, specifically a flare forecast rather than a general space weather overview. You've got your, your categories here, but check out what I was saying earlier. It's the M and the X class flares we care about. So the R2, um, R1 to R2 is related to M class flares. So you're producing an M class flare forecast there. And then the very active um, radio blackout activity is related to X class flare forecasts. And they'll forecast that usually for at least the next 24 hours, um, but you can actually also have them for several days afterwards, depending on the forecasting center. So how do we get from that property, that you know, helicity or, or alpha, beta, gamma, delta classification to a, a number, a probability? That's where your mathematical modeling comes in. Um, so really classic example um, um, is just simple statistical methods for something like this. This is a table from Bloomfield et al that uses a really simple Poisson technique that I'm sure Peter could tell you a lot more about because of course it's something that he came up with uh, many many years ago that's used in solar monitor um, and in this particular case um, it assumes a Poisson process and uses average flare rates to calculate that probability value. So this is the Macintosh classification, slightly simple, uh, more complex but a different complexity and classification scheme. It looks at the number of regions that were each classification. It looks at how many flares were associated with each classification and then calculates these average flare rates. And then you get a probability value by assuming a Poisson process. So I think it's like the, the equation is one minus um, e to the power of minus the average flare rate. Something really, really simple, um, but it works really, really effectively. Um, it's a really simple, well-tried, tested, robust technique that is used as a standard in a lot of different operational centers around the world. Um, um, of course, over the years, we've improved our stats. You know, we have bigger data sets of more regions over more solar cycles. 
And, and we're almost flooded with information nowadays, you know, um, things like Solar Dynamics Observatory gives us terabytes of data every single day. So more and more you've seen a move away from statistical methods and particularly in the research field and to more complex technique like machine learning methods. And um, so people really have started dabbling with that. Um, and all different kinds of machine learning techniques have been attempted on these magnetic active region properties like flux or helicity for forecasting purposes. You know, support vector machines, random forests, logistic regression, artificial neural networks, pretty much name a machine learning method has probably been tried at this point. Um, it's a very, very, very popular technique um, at the moment in, in space weather research for forecasting, but it hasn't quite got as far as operational forecasting yet. Um, because there's a big caveat here with all these techniques I'm talking about, it's really important to note that whatever method is used, there is always a human forecaster in the loop in these operational centers. You know, you have the Met Office, you've got SWIPSI forecasting 24 seven. There's someone there um, to keep an eye on these models. And um, they will edit those probability values if they think they're not quite right. You know, if it's a 20%, they think it's too high, they'll drop it to 10 before they issue that guidance. And that four day forecast, I showed you for a reason actually, because it really highlights the importance of a human forecaster because um, they actually, only use the mathematical models to give you a number for that day one forecast, but those day two to four, they come up with themselves. So they have a look at what regions are coming back on disk, which ones are leaving the solar disk, and, and use their own human expertise to figure out what they think the forecast should be for those um, further out days. And you know, they really don't quite trust the automated methods, as even if they've been, you know, even though they've been running for years. Um, and as you said, you know, flare forecasting is the most established field in, in space weather forecasting, but it, we're not quite there with the accuracy yet. And I think that shows us, you know, how new we are compared to seeing weather forecasting. We're a few decades behind in terms of accuracy. Um, We've had a bit of a flooded market in flare forecasting as well, and um, we have all these new machine learning techniques coming in, but the forecasters don't quite trust them yet because what they need to see is they need to know how accurate they are compared to their standard operational benchmarks. Um, and that is a really key part of space weather forecasting that I want to highlight to you all is, which is very different than maybe um, your basic research is that you need to consider community evaluation with your forecast. So you're not just writing a paper for a new flare forecast. You need to see how it compares to everybody else's and if it improves upon what the space weather forecaster is using already. And it's not something that we were very good at for many, many years. We all wrote our papers very separately. We use different data sets to say how accurate they are. We all use different um, metrics like skill scores and things like that, whatever our favorite ones were. But a couple of years ago, um, we decided to change that and learn very much from how the weather forecasting community does these things and um, run a bit of a community evaluation project on where we were with flare forecasting. Um, I won't go into the massive details of this plot, but I just really wanted to show you the kinds of things that we do differently in maybe operational forecasting compared to, to research forecasting is these kinds of projects. And what you're seeing here is something called a reliability diagram. You've got your uh, frequency of observations versus your, um, your, your probability. So in an ideal world, you'll forecast 20% chance and you'll observe 20% of the time flares. So you want all those plots and um, the points in the plot along that diagonal in the middle there. But you can see these are an array of different operational center forecasts from all around the world. You know, the Americans, the British, the Japanese, the, the Koreans, the you know, South Africans, the Australians that I showed on that map. And um, you've got stats there, you've got machine learning techniques. You can see none of them are perfectly along that diagonal. And um, they're all not that great. Um, and actually this, 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 um, study showed us that the, the forecast to beat is the human forecaster. Um, so it was a really, really useful study for us to understand the limitations of our science, of you know, the research models that we produce, and realize that we needed to go back to the drawing board a little bit and think about our data inputs, because 
we all use these magnetograms and these properties as the starting point. And actually we found that using other data sets like you know, EUV images, for example, actually can improve upon these things. So it's a, it's a different kind of thing that you, then you'll find in basic research, but it's actually a really, really rewarding process to work together and to find out where we are in the state of the art of the field. And if you're interested in, 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 in learning a little bit more about this kind of benchmarking community evaluation process, I'll direct you to something called the, the scoreboards. And this is hosted at NASA Community Coordinated Modeling Center. Um, and here's an example here of the solar flare scoreboard. You click on an active region and it shows you the different percentage probability forecasts from all those different centers around the world. So you can keep an eye on what your, your collaborators in other countries are, are thinking about in terms of their values and how active they think the sun is. And there's also an average there um, which is something we learn from weather forecasting. Um, often, you know, forecasters don't want a choice. They don't want 20 methods thrown at them. They just want a simple, uh, single uh, mathematical output. So a simple average is useful. So they can just kind of then edit that as much as they want. Um, so there's flare, if you're not interested in flares, there's also probabilistic forecasts for SEPs. BZ as well. So BZ prediction is just a massive hot topic in, in space weather forecasting. It really is something that needs to be improved upon and it is a big active area of research. So it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in space weather forecasting. Um, and these are all a little bit different than um, this one here, which is actually the oldest scoreboard, which is the CME arrival time prediction scoreboard. And I wanted to highlight this because it is different than these other probabilistic forecasts, because right now we do not forecast CMEs probabilistically. You can see that in our SWPSI diagram here, we've got percentage chances for our flares and our SEPs, but not for our CMEs. And we're only monitoring the conditions on the sun. And, and I think uh, Richard which, you know, mentioned this yesterday, this is a hot topic. You know, if someone can figure out CME onset prediction, um, you know, they're really onto a winner there in terms of working with the forecasters. The forecasters would love to have this probabilistic prediction. We're not quite there with the science yet, and hopefully we will over the next, you know, few years, particularly with some machine learning methods that we've seen being used at the moment. Um, but in the meantime, all they do is they observe the CME, um, analyze its kind of you know characteristics and then predict its arrival at earth so it'll say it'll arrive at midday plus or minus so many hours to do that it uses the combination which is really interesting of um, data analysis and modeling um, so this is literally a simple click tool that forecasters are using again there's that human in the loop there a lot of operational forecasting is all about the forecaster and not just the, the modeling techniques. So they'll click on you know, the observations. This is the stereo CME analysis tool. You'll find it at CCMC. It's a great place to just have a look at space weather models. Actually, they have loads um, available. So they'll um, look at its angular extent. They'll look at its location. They use difference imaging to find out its speed. And then they input those parameters into a model like Enlil, like Richard showed you yesterday, um, where it's a heliospheric propagation model. You've got your solar wind background speeds there. Um, but then you, when you input the CME, and I literally mean there's an IT system where the forecasters will type in the numbers of the CME speed and location and press run, and it'll rerun this NLL model for them um, and input the CME to see when these CMEs will arrive at Earth. Um, and this is a, you know something I really wanted to, to highlight quickly before I finish up, because I think this is the, one of the key models that's relevant for radio because you know I want to try and find the radio spin with all the space weather forecasting and right now operationally especially for the flares and, and stuff like that there isn't too much radio involved um, but in terms of CME prediction it is radio is a, a really perfect backup to these kinds of MHD models um, in uh, UCSD in the US Bernie Jackson and also Mario BC, I think in, in the UK are, is very involved in this. They have a version of the Enlil model, which is driven by interplanetary scintillation um, data, which of course you would have learned from Richard um, yesterday. And um, so IPS is a really good backup. So say our coronagraphs go down and we don't have those CME observations, we can get information from our radio data to help us with some of these space weather models. So it's a really important backup stuff. And it's be radio is being used more widely now, particularly with the low far space weather project. I'm sure in a 
article, we'll, we'll, we'll mention stuff about that later on. Um, but one thing I want to I highlight before I finish up, I'm just looking at the time here, is that these are all very operational models and it is quite a different thing um, to work operationally compared to work in research, which is why it was in the title of my talk at the very beginning. You know, it's operational versus research. You know, an operational model, this is classic requirements for the Met Office. You had to have this real time observation stream, which is unfailing, which is a really hard thing to do in operations because actually in space weather, we're reliant on science missions like SOHO, like SDO, they're science missions. Something Richard Harrison mentioned yesterday, actually, it's really only GOES and the upcoming L5 mission, which are operational. So we need more operational space weather missions for sure um, to, to make sure we're, we're fulfilling these operational requirements. So in terms of the observation streams, they need to be unfailing. In terms of our model codes, they need to be super well tested, super well written. This is where our GitHub repositories and our version control and our proper documentation and unit tests, you know, the things, the kind of things you were you were looking at with your, your GitHub stuff for the past couple of days. This is where this comes in. These things have to be absolutely watertight in terms of reliability, and they have to be easily um, corrected, easily checked super robust and you're basically ending up with 99% plus reliability so it's a different kind of thing than your you know your usual just normal research kind of writing a paper doing a bit of copy paste code and um, for your app j or your solar physics paper it's taking that uh, research and we call it the research to operations process you take that research idea um, and you transition it into this operation. So you find the interesting spark of an idea that could be useful for a forecaster, but you have to take it through this development phase. You know, this is where your software um, development comes in, where your community evaluation against benchmarks come in. Um, but in the end, you end up with an operational product. And I know it kind of sounds probably a little bit more complex than your everyday science work, but it's a very rewarding process to see your research um, being, in, you know, being used in operations um, in these kinds of centers. And I find um, personally that I get a lot out of it from my research perspectives too, just talking to the research, you know, the, the, the forecasters, you can learn a lot about the kinds of things that they want to improve. Um, and they actually, because they're looking at the sun all the time, you get so much interesting feedback about in terms of the accuracy of your models and they're keeping an eye on, you know, these, these kind of evaluation metrics. So it's this kind of, you know, it's not just an R2O research to operations process, but it's also an operations to research process. It's, um, it's a feedback and you can learn so much um, from this kind of work. And I would say, you know, the one thing I really do whenever I start something in Soda or Helio or any sort of space for the research project, it's to consider who your users are, because it might be that you have a really cool research project that could be useful for the space weather forecasting. Um, and I know users can kind of put people off, they probably think industry, um, but it doesn't just mean that. It could just be, you know, think about, is it just my colleague who I'm working with in the office that's going to use this? Is it someone else in the space weather field? Because I think we use a lot of techniques that are really similar. There's a lot of overlap between the, the kinds of code we write in solar, heliosphere, magnetosphere, ionospheric physics that we can learn from each other. And something that I've definitely learned about, you know, just even going outside our field and working with weather scientists and the kinds of things they do, or even developers. Especially if you're going to work in machine learning, you have to be able to, to talk the language of um, some more software related people. Um, so really thinking about the kind of the bigger space weather community and um, can be very, very useful thing for your own research. So I highly recommend um, taking that step and, and thinking about what um what your what your research projects might be useful for, because maybe it um it'll be helpful for a forecaster. Or maybe it's just a nice thing, you know, Aurora figure for your, your next public talk. Um, but whatever it is, it's worth having a think about that. Um, so I'm going to finish up here. because I know I had to leave um, a 10 on the dot and I want to make sure there's time for questions. I just wanted to highlight before I finish, this is pretty much today's space weather forecast. Um, and it's super boring at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's very, very green. You can see there's no red regions and there's hardly any sunspots on the sun. Um, but last week, was it last week? I think we had our first X flare in absolutely ages. So the sun, yeah. the, now is the perfect time. Yeah, now is the perfect time to start looking at things like solarmonitor.org 
or these space weather prediction center things because the sun is finally waking up. There's finally sunspots. Um, so it's the perfect time to get into interesting space weather stuff and, and monitoring the sun. So I do suggest you kind of check out these websites regularly and become a bit of a, uh, you know, a personal space weather forecaster for yourselves. So that's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Hey, thanks so much, Sophia. That was fantastic. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Alberto, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. So you touched on on uh, the government's mitigating plans for in the case of a, another Carrington event. Um, is the mitigating plan just turning everything off? Is that even enough to protect our grids or is there anything else we have to do? It's a whole variety of things depending on the technology for sure. Um, if we're talking about electrical grids, it also varies in, in, in terms of the country. If you're really high up in latitude, like you're in Sweden or Iceland or those higher latitude countries, you're probably going to have way stricter mitigation procedures than someone like us in lower latitudes because they're going to be more impacted. There's a lot of interesting research into new technologies about using different kinds of transformer components that are a bit more hardy to space weather so they're leading a lot of those um, kinds of studies and um, you know i talk you know further down we have less of a, a thing it's very much a monitoring they might turn off important parts of the grid and redirect some power if they think there's something going to happen in the uk i remember talking to the power company there and um, it's all it's almost just about um, a human management perspective as well making sure there's senior staff are on shift um, in, in an event that they, you know, if they think, oh, there could be something happening in the next few days, make sure that the right people are there to make the right decisions. So it will vary. Um, and and um, it's, a, it's interesting to see how different countries are approaching this, this problem. If, if I could just add to that. Yeah, well, we're going. Um, uh, one thing that, um, one strategy is that if, uh, say, transformers are out of operation for like they're being worked on or so on, they just open up all the circuits to allow free yeah. flow of current through the network. And that stops excess current building up in particular transformers. And, you know, it's the excess current that causes dual heating and burning out of things. So, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but to open up the circuits and just let free flow is, is one mitigation mm -hmm. strategy. And the other one is large capacitors, capacitor banks at a critical piece of infrastructure that will smooth out uh, fluctuations. This is why it's so important to so, LCR circuit theory. And exactly. <laughs> to, to do studies on this, you know, like we had um, some, you know, some studies with air grid to figure out the Irish power grid, because each different power grid will probably be very different in each country because they'll be using different components. So important for each country to do their own kind of studies. I mean, the, 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 that really famous uh, Hydro-Quebec one, they reckon it wouldn't have happened if one of their high voltage transformer lines wasn't down for maintenance. So they'd taken it yeah. down to do maintenance and that put extra current through the other two and that's why the grid went down. That's one of the theories anyways. Yeah, it's fascinating. So they really have to make sure they understand their grids and how they might be impacted. Uh, Mohammed, do you have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, good morning. Hey. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, I wonder what are the current limitations to get uh, a more accurate forecasting system? What are the challenges? Is it like uh, data or methodologies or? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a combination. Again, it depends on your forecast. For flare mm -hmm. forecasting, for example, we found that it's our data inputs. We've been doing the same thing over and over again, using magnetograms for, for too long. Um, and so we found that using new data sources um, had been really key in improving that. Um, and, but we didn't have known that until we looked at the evaluations. So really for a forecast, you have to evaluate them before you understand your limitations. For something like um, SEP forecasting, I think they, they kind of have been using kind of similar techniques to flare forecasting and they're not quite there yet. The, also the problem with SCP forecasting is that it's really a rare event problem. You have hardly any events um, to, in order to produce accurate forecasts. So stats are just impossible. Um, so that's really kind of waiting for more events for stats. And then for the CME forecasting, you know, the limitation there is that we don't have one yet. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's trying to improve our science. This is where we really need the research community to work with forecasting community 
um, because we know what the gaps are in our forecasts and, and we really need some researchers to come along and improve our science understanding to start creating forecasts for them. Thank you. And I come and maybe one last question because I know Sophie has to run, but we can continue this discussion. Yeah, and... absolutely. Um, yeah, I guess my, my question was very similar to Mohammed's. I was going to ask, what do you think is missing? Um, I know that the SCP forecasting is still not uh, very mature, for example. Yeah. But maybe you can comment. In yeah, general, I... what, what do you need from, what do forecasters uh, need from the scientists? There's a, there's a great figure um, from the Met Office. I can share it on Slack later. When I worked there, we did a bit of a user survey um, to figure out what the forecasters, uh, <laughs> Peter says, don't even mention CVs. Yeah, exactly. What the forecasters uh, think is missing in terms of the gaps in, in forecasting. And there were there were a few key things. One was on uh, CME onset forecasting. They just really want it. They want to know when the CME are all rot and what its magnitude is, which is just absolutely impossible from a science perspective at the moment. I think we will get there eventually, but it's really, really hard. BZ prediction is a massive hot topic. They want more accurate BZ forecast. They want to know if it's pointing north or south. I didn't really mention it because I know we haven't gotten to the magnetosphere later, um, but that might come up again later on in that lecture. So that's a really key hot topic. And I think since I did that, because it's been a number of years, I think SCP forecasting has become more important. It's something I completely avoid like the plague because it's so hard because of that rare event statistics. And um, but if with our with our, you know, like I was saying, with the Mars missions coming up and moon missions and yeah. radiation storms are just key and a lot of the um the funding calls that i've seen for kind of operational stuff have been related to scp forecasting so not just the onset but also better radiation belt modeling um at earth is a really really key thing it's something that you know i i, I often talk about the solar sector because it's something i've worked on with years but we definitely have data limitations on our Earth stuff too. We definitely have a lack of data for ionospheric modeling and thermospheric modeling as well. So anything that we can improve on the Earth monitoring side uh, would be really good as well. But I think they're the key things. Um, but I'll definitely share that slide um, later on. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so yeah, if any more questions, please put them in the Slack channel. Um, and maybe we'll take a 15 minute break now. Um, and we'll be back here by quarter past, so 10.15. Yeah, I'll be back later on. So any more yeah, questions? Yeah, thanks, Sophie. That was fascinating. Know. I think we could have a whole morning of discussion. I know we could on, definitely. On, on. So, so do follow up with questions on Slack, or I'll pop back later as well. Yeah, I I have a, a Twitter burst coming up with. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch out for it. <laughs> yeah, low force space weather, and Nicole will talk about that later on as well. I think that's super important. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>